hello and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. In the world of reduced budgets that many agencies are facing now, we're becoming more and more dependent on grants for funding. Today we will discuss where to look for grants, meeting the requirements, and how to write a grant in a professional and concise manner. Thank you for joining us today for our program, Introduction to Grant Writing. If you have a question about anything being discussed today, please call or email during our broadcast. The phone number and email address are on your screen now and will appear again later in the program. Also, the handout, sign-in sheet, and evaluation are all available online. You'll need to register for the program in order to access those materials. Continuing education credits have been approved for nurses and social workers for today's program. In order to receive credit for this training, you must watch the entire program, then complete and return the sign-in sheet and evaluation. While content may continue to be relevant, continuing education credit will only be awarded for one year for nurses, expiring on January 31, 2018, and two years for social workers, expiring on January 31, 2019. If you're watching this program on demand and want to receive a social work continuing education certificate, you'll need to complete the social work test and send it in along with your sign-in sheet and evaluation. If you're watching this program live, there is no social work test required. I'm Renee Carpenter, State Social Work Director for the Alabama Department of Public Health, and joining me is Carolyn Byrne, Director of the Office of Community Affairs at ADPH. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you, Renee, and it's good to be here. When we started to um, talk about this program, Renee and I were expecting about 80 social workers on the program. And so what I want to do is talk a little bit about grant writing. And of course, in one hour, we're not going to be able to cover all aspects of grant writing. So today, the objectives that we're going to cover is really to determine if you're ready to write a grant, to understand what funding sources are out there, and also to understand what funders are looking for, and then we'll briefly go over parts of a grant. After the um, one hour presentation, you can let me know if you all would like to do additional grant writing components. So for example, we could cover needs assessment and how to write a needs assessment. So um, we'll look to do that in the future. First of all, let's talk about are you ready to write a grant? Grant funding is lots of work. Um, people are either giving you, if it's a federal grant, they're giving you taxpayer money. If it's a foundation grant, they're giving you foundation money. And there are strings attached. So what I want to be careful of is the fact that writing a grant is a, um, you have to plan it out. And secondly, there is work that comes into grant writing along the way. So there are strings attached. So the first thing you need to sort of address, do you have a well thought out project? Um, do you know what kind of goals and objectives you want to meet? Um, how much time as an employee do you have to work on a grant project? And what are the outcomes of the project? Um, also, we need to look at the needs of the community um, and how you will make a impact on the community, on project outcomes. Um, is this a project that can be replicated? Because a lot of the grant funders want to see something that can be replicated that other communities can use. Is this a project that can be sustainable? And we're going to talk about sustainability in another slide. But to, in today's environment, uh, people want to know that the project will go forward whether the funding is there or not. The other things that um, they look at is, of course, most grants offer it to 501c3s. Um, you usually are a not-for-profit if you're applying for a grant. And what, it, what the projects want to know is what type of population are you going to reach with the grant? Are the timelines that you're going to put in the grant achievable? And what are the reporting requirements that you might have to meet? So how are you going to track? any kinds of activities that you have, and how are you going to measure outcomes. These are all things that need to be considered up front. Um, when I'm talking with people in communities, particularly rural communities, 
I think there are a lot of opportunities for people to look at local business or civic organizations such as Junior League, um, Civitan, Kiwanis, Rotary. Um, they sometimes will offer small grants and that's a great place to start in just learning how to write a grant and present a project. So I would encourage you to look in your local community and look at these maybe local businesses that are there. Um, certainly Hyundai in Montgomery offered a lot of grant opportunities because these companies do want to give back to their community. Um, we are going to go over in a little bit of detail um, our private grants, which can be on the state or national level. I have just um, myself looked at Kresge Foundation for the first time as an opportunity for a grant. And one of the things with these grant foundations is that you need to sort of register sometimes and get a password to even look at what they offer. So sometimes they, they want to know who you are before they even allow you to look at their guidance or what grants they're offering. Um, I am going to take you through a foundation or a website. We're going to go through two foundation grants today. Um, the other kind of grants that you have, we do have state grants. Even Alabama Department of Public Health does give some small grants through their Chronic Disease Management Department. A DECA has grants that we've applied for. And then there are federal grants such as HRSA and CDC. Now, for the public health people on the call, um, we do not, the federal grants are a little bit more complicated. Uh, for people who are not public health people, grants.gov is a site I would encourage you to go on. They will send you email updates about grants that are available and you can sign up on their listserv. But Federal grants are a little bit more complex in that you have to have a DUNS number, you have to do pre-registration, um, and all of the public health federal grants are going to be handled within the central office. Um, I also want to mention to public health people that if you are going to apply for a foundation or a federal grant, please go through Jamie Durham in the Bureau of Professional and Support Services to um, let him know if you plan to apply for any grants. Um, and as I said, for those that are not public health employees, I would definitely get on grants.gov and join their listserv. I get listserv notices every single day on federal grants that come out through grants.gov. So what we're going to do now is I wanted to take you to the Rural Information Hub, which is a really neat um, website, but it also posts grants on that website. And so um, Ryan is going to switch over your screen. Um, also, Ryan had told me that he was going to display the website address if you all wanted to get on your computers and look at the website. This is a great. This has great resources generally for rural communities, of which Alabama has a tremendous number of rural communities. But what I wanted to show you is just sort of how the website works. The screen that you're looking at, what we clicked on was funding and opportunities for Alabama only. Every state has a page for funding and opportunities. Unfortunately, other states may have more foundations than Alabama does, so um, they may have a longer list. But let's just look at how this works. So if you're trying to locate an opportunity for your community, let's look at the first BBVA Compass Foundation grant. One of the things that they post is the geographic coverage area. So what we want to make sure of is that our state is included in this, and obviously on the Alabama page it would be. Um, they also have an application deadline of September 29, 2017. Sometimes foundation grants are rolling grants, which means that they, you can apply at any time. Um, so you really need to look at that. So I have just clicked on BBVA Compass Foundation and I'm going to view their program website because I want to show you some features that are usually handled on foundation grants. Um, what they do is they will tell you the requirements that they have for their foundation grant. Do not apply for a grant um, if your topic 
that you want to cover is not included on the list that you see here on your screen for BBVA, but everyone has a unique focus area. Um, they also tell you that they're going to give strong consideration to certain things on BBVA. They talk about exhibiting significant support from an employee. So if your partnership, if you have some community idea or project and you really want to make your application stronger, you would approach your local bank, BBVA, Compass Bank, and see if you could get an employee to work with you on the application because that obviously is something they're looking for. I have no idea. They say target individuals or communities well, with LMI levels. Anybody know what LMI <laughs> levels are? I meant to look that up. So that would be something I would have to question the foundation on. Um, they want to build inclusive and diverse communities, and they want to foster collaborative effort that leverage community involve, investment and involvement. So that's sort of the sustainability issue. They want to make sure that other people are going to be supporting this too. So that, that would lead me to believe they would like to see broad partnership of other people in the community. As you scroll down, um, obviously we're public health, so we would look at the category of health and human services, and they tell you what they give priority to. So when you look at that list, it's enable and sustain independence for individuals and families, ensure access to health education programs, or ensure access to quality health care. So it, your project would have to focus on one of those three areas. So you would want to make sure that. The other thing I want to point out is they do have a list of limitations. This is for all foundations. They usually have a limitation. And if you notice, they don't, um, they don't want any programs of a national scope. So they really are more community orient oriented. Um, they don't except religious organizations that are not engaged in a significant project that is non-sectarian and benefits a broad base of the community. So as you look at this list, if your project does not meet one of these requirements, don't apply because it will be rejected. Um, they also, on foundations, they have an eligibility quiz that you take before you go into the foundation and look at the app application. And BBVA does have an eligibility quiz that you can click on, and it will bring you to a screen where you answer questions. So the first question, are you in one of the states? So it really does help you screen out anything that you should not apply for. Um, so I don't know if there are any questions on that, but I did want to demonstrate just very briefly some of the screens that are available on foundation grants. Now, another very interesting thing in Alabama is that we have several foundations, and you can Google Top Alabama Giving Foundation Grants and get a list of the biggest foundations in Alabama. And as you see, the Community Foundation of Greater Birmingham is our largest foundation as far as distributing grant funding. So what I would encourage you all to do is look at your community foundations in the different regions in the state. Um, you can see that there's a community foundation of South Alabama that's number two. We have a Walker Area Communication Foundation in, uh, or community, excuse me, in Walker County. Um, and so this is a list of all the top giving foundations. As I said, this is just available through Google. Um, some of these foundations I have never heard of, the Alpha Foundation, Inc., Hugh Cole Foundation, and they all have different missions. So if you're looking for a foundation, you would go through it just like we went through BBVA and look to see if their mission matches what you want to do with your project. If the mission of the foundation does not match what you want to do with the project, do not apply they will reject you right up front. Um, so here's another example on this list, too, that I have here is Shelby County Community Health Foundation. Um, you will see that there are other foundations. Um, West Alabama, Community Foundation of West Alabama is in this top list of 20. 
Um, so that is sort of an overview of an example of a source for foundation grants on the Rural Health Information Hub. Um, we did not get, we're going to go through an Alabama Power Grant in just a little bit. Um, let me just flip back to federal grants. As I said, for public health personnel, all federal grants will go through the central office. For people who are not public health, grants.gov obviously is really the key website for federal grants. There are a lot of compliance and reporting issues that you have when you write for a federal grant. There's a lot of registration issues that you have. And these grants have, um, they have complicated budgetary forms that have to be filled out. So I don't recommend for a new grant writer that you start with a federal grant. I recommend that you do more of a community grant or you approach a business in your community and write up a proposal or you go with a foundation grant. So let's just talk a little bit about um, some tips on local or foundation grants. Um, we have different terms and lingo as everybody has. Um, FOA is a common term and it means funding announcement or funding opportunity announcement really for the FOA. And then you also have requests for proposal which is RFP. I think RFP is more, that was more common a couple of years ago. FOA is a newer term but they mean the same thing. Um, grant guidance this is a grant guidance that you would download. Um, the recommendation is whenever you read a grant announcement, an FOA or an RFP, you read it multiple times. Um, there are a lot of words in there that you need to really pay close attention to. So we recommend that you do read it multiple times. For federal grants, and this is something we might do in a future grant writing um, website or webinar is they have a grading sheet at the back of the guidance. And so what I recommend to people, and it's a really neat trick, is not only do you read the grant from front to back, but you also look at how the grant is going to be graded. And what they do is they give points to certain parts of the grant. So you know sometimes in a grant you have to write an evaluation plan. And sometimes that evaluation plan is worth 30 or 40 points, which shows you that they are going to put a lot of the grading into the evaluation. So when you have reviewers of grants, they may be people that know nothing about health care or know nothing about um, what you do with your program. And so they're going to be grading you competitively and they're going to be grading from the grading sheet at the back of the grant for federal grants. Foundation grants will also tell you what they're looking for and what I would do in that case is make an outline of what they're telling you they're, they're focused on. So for example when we looked at BBVA we know access to care was one of the areas they were focused on. We also know that they wanted to include somebody from the BBVA bank in that community in the grant. So what you would do is you would set up a checklist of priority items, priority review items. Um, I have County Health Department here because as I said we ha did not expect the response to intro to grant writing that we got. So, but the, the key thing here is do you have the capacity as an organization to do what the funding announcement, the FOA, or the request for proposal is asking you to do. Capacity is a huge issue. Now, let me tell you my first mistake in writing a grant. I wrote a grant, a $6,000 grant. Okay, how much work do you think a $6,000 grant would be? I thought that would be minimal work. It was not. Um, so the amount of the grant is always not a reflection of how much work you have to do. I probably would not have written that $6,000 grant again after we got finished with it because it, it really took more time than the $6,000 brought us. So be very aware when you get into a grant FOA or RFP that you're really understanding the work that you're going to have to put into it and is the money worth the effort. Um, 
And that is a mistake that a lot of um, first-time grant writers make um, because they think, oh, if I go for the smaller grant, it's going to be easier to handle. Not necessarily. So one of the things that you need to look at is how much time can you allocate and is the money worth your time? And you always have to buffer in that it's going to take longer than you think it takes. The other thing that, you're, that you need to take a look at is the reporting requirements. Sometimes they have you report quarterly. Sometimes they have you report monthly. Sometimes they have you report semi-annually. And sometimes they have you report annually. So you need to have a tracking system in place. That was another mistake I made when I first was writing grants, is that you, know, you think you can remember everything you do um, with your grant and so really putting in the tracking system ahead of time really benefits you when reporting requirements come up. The other tips that we will um, talk about is in today's environment of grant writing outcomes is an incredibly important piece along with sustainability. Um, it used to be that we would have grants and we would say we did 20 trainings with a thousand people and that's great but how did that training impact those people and what did, what did they do after the training to impact their community and so we never really in grant writing years and years ago we just reported numbers, activities, and trainings, and that was fine. In today's environment, they really want to know, did the training make a difference? How did it impact your community? What changes do you see as a result of that training? So it's a little bit more in-depth than it was in the past, and as money dries up, um, you know, funders have more people applying and, quite honestly, want to see outcomes. And they want to see outcomes that can be replicated, too. So the other important thing is, if you are public health, how does the grant relate to your mission of the organization? So as public health, are we going to apply for grants that really don't match our mission? And so you have to be careful of that. Any entity has to be careful that they make sure the grant that they're reviewing or applying for does match the mission of their organization. Um, another easily um, challenging piece of a grant is the budget. So in public health with our federal grants, you know, when you write a federal grant, you have to have finance check off on the grant. Janice Cook in the central office usually reviews all the budgets for our federal grants. Um, and I'm sure in other community organizations, you have somebody who will be reviewing the budget. Um, so you have to understand how your internal budget system or process works. Um, how will the accounting be set up for the grant budget? Um, one of the things that I've seen with not-for-profit organizations that apply for grants um, when they're not experienced is sometimes they won't set up separate accounts for the separate grants. There's a danger in commingling funds, meaning taking the funds from the grant and putting it in with funds of your organization. You never want to do that. So you really have to make sure you've got the infrastructure and the expertise that you keep the accounting processes separate for the grant that you're going to be working on. Even with $6,000, I had to keep that money separate from all other money. So it's not, it doesn't matter how much the grant is. It's you, that, the fact that you have to account for those dollars and you should not commingle. Do we have any questions so far? Okay. All right, we'll go on. Um, they do offer technical assistance calls on foundation grants. Um, they usually have a schedule posted, and they'll be monthly or quarterly. Um, they encourage you to get on a technical assistance grants. Federal grants as well have technical assistance calls. I would encourage you to participate in any kind of technical assistance call for the grants. 
because if you have no questions, that's fine, but you will hear other people ask questions, and the answers may help you write a better grant. Um, the other thing that happens sometimes, and um, I had a coworker, and we were working on a grant, and the grant wanted to know more about the community need. She wrote three pages. It was the most awesome travel log I have ever read. She wrote about the history of the community. She wrote about all of the wonderful things in the community, but it was not answering the, the grant question. So it was, I told her we could post it on travel and leisure, and um, it, was, it was wonderful, but that if somebody was reviewing the grant and reading what she wrote, they, they would not find the answer to the question that was posed in the grant. So it's very easy to get off track, and you need to really go back and make sure you're answering the questions they're asking. The other thing that we have a tendency to do um, in grant writing, and I'm speaking you know, of myself, is sometimes we want to write more than what they ask for because you're really passionate about your program or your project. But the rule of thumb is to be clear, concise, and to the point. Um, so we don't want to put in a lot of narrative just to show we know a lot about the subject. We want to make sure that we're keeping it extremely simple so that the reviewer who may know nothing about health care, who may be just out of college, we've had some reviewers that just graduate college and they review a grant, can read the question and come to the answer. The other thing that um, I will say is it's always nice to repeat terminology that are in the question. So if it asks, what is the demographic makeup of the community? Then you would say the demographic makeup of West Blockton, Alabama is. So you're using the words in the question and you're answering the question with those words. Um, so we're assuming that the reader and reviewer knows nothing about your organization. They know nothing about the project. But we really want to make sure we keep it clear and concise. All right. Some more tips. Um, make sure the application flows well. It should be logical and organized. Um, so, And that seems pretty obvious to most of us, but when you start writing, sometimes you can go, I call them pig trails. <laughs> so you can go off on a pig trail very easily. So what I do is I usually find somebody like my spouse, who knows nothing about what I do day in and day out or nothing about really the topic that I may be focusing on and I have somebody outside of my organization read the grant because they will pick up on things that nobody in the organization may pick up on. You know, we assume that people know what we're talking about. So it's always nice to have somebody with fresh eyes review a grant and so I would strongly recommend that. I also, when I have people review grants, if there is a grading sheet, I give them the grading sheet to review the grant by. So they know what the grant funder is looking for. Um, let's see, someone else, so that's what I just talked about. Um, that's a really good trick. You know, you may have, Renee may review a grant I have, but if we're working on the same project, she may not catch something my husband might catch. Acronyms. I get teased all the time because we talk in acronyms. Um, I've worked in several different agencies, not-for-profits, for-profits, um, and there's always lingo that goes with any topic or any agency you work in. And um, so what we did um, in our grants, if you're going to use acronyms, make sure the acronym is defined. So let's say it's letter of agreement. You would have in parentheses LOA, and then what we have done, if we have a lot of acronyms, for example, Office of Primary Care and Rural Health was OPCRH. So if we have a lot of acronyms, we had like 40 acronyms in one grant we wrote, we did an acronym page so that the person who's reviewing the grant could just have a separate page to look at as they read the grant, and the acronyms were defined right there on a separate page. 
So you could do some types of attachments like that if the grant guidance allows you to do it. And I would recommend staying away from a whole lot of acronyms. Well, is it beneficial to use both an acronym page and include it in the narrative? I think it is beneficial to use both. And I think particularly, I mean, if you're writing a project that does not have a lot of acronyms, certainly you don't need to do an acronym page. Make sure that you check with the grant the grant guidance or that on a technical assistance call you make sure how they're going to count those pages. That's the other thing I want to tell you about grants. If it says 20 pages, they mean 20 pages. So you need to understand what is included in those 20 pages. An abstract, which is a summary of the grant, may or may not be included in those 20 pages. Um, so an acronym list, if you do have a lot of acronyms, I think it's very helpful as long as you know if it's included in, you know, you're not going over 20 pages. I have seen where people have not followed margins on a grant and the whole grant was thrown out. It was not even read. Or if they say do Times New Roman or they tell you, you know, we want 12 point font and you do 14 point font, they don't even read the grant. So what I want you to know is grant writers, new grant writers particularly, if there's something in there that says we want inch and a half margins all around the page and you do an inch margin all around the page, they may never read your grant. So it's really important that you pay attention to the directions because what, what a funder will think is if you can't follow directions in this grant guidance, then why should I give you money? You know, are you going to be really responsible for the money? So, yeah, so I've heard horror stories. If it says no color in a grant, don't use color. If it says attachments, which is where I would put an acronym list, count towards the pages, then you better make sure you have 20 pages with the attachments and not over. So these are things that they don't, they don't put up with because those are the directions. So you have to be very careful with that. All right, I wanted to go over just a couple of terms that are important today. Um, we're hearing more and more about evidence-based. Everything you want to do is evidence-based. So many of you who run programs and projects are very familiar with this word. Um, so what does evidence-based really mean? It means that the project has been tried before in numerous locations, not just in one location, that somebody has written a review study and has published it, and that the results overall were positive. So. Some of the grants we write, um, for example, we're looking at a grant right now on Adverse Childhood Experiences, or ACEs is what the acronym is. Now, ACEs is sort of a newer, I guess, mental health topic. Concept. <laughs> yeah, or concept um, that has come out at a lot of meetings that Renee and many of the social workers on this call have attended. Um, so, are there, so when we look at ACEs, what we're trying to do in writing our project is we want to look at other evidence-based practices around ACEs and then maybe tweak it a little bit to fit Alabama. So it's important that you pick a project that, may, that you can refer back to and say, this has been tried in other locations, here's what the evidence is showing us. Um, so that when you do build a project, keep that in mind that funders really want to see evidence-based. The other issue in today's environment is sustainable. So what does sustainable mean? Um, we are dealing with this um, on lots of different projects here at Public Health. So how is the project going to continue if the grant funding goes away? Now, sometimes that's a really hard thing to answer. So what you have to look at is you have to sort of look at return on investment, which is also a new concept because sustainability can be shown through return on investments and money that you save. So, for example, if we were going to do something that diverts patients from the emergency room, let's say we do an asthma project and we keep mothers um, from running to the emergency room with their children by having case management support. That's an example. What we would do is we would set up in the grant a way to track the intervention to see how many patients did not use the ER because they were able to call a case manager or a nurse 
or somebody with their questions or a physician after hours with their questions about an inhaler, for example. Um, then we could document how much savings and what the return on investment is. We know through CDC figures that asthma education, for every dollar invested, it saves seven dollars. So you're, you have a nice return on investment. Um, so you could almost go to a hospital and say, we have saved this many ER visits and this would have cost you this much money. Will you help us fund the project in the future? So that can be sustainability. Sustainability can also be looking at other funding streams. And as many of you um, who are on the call know from nonprofits, you never rely on one funder for a program. Because if that funder goes away and you don't have plans to involve other funders, then you cannot sustain your project. So it's important right up front when you get the money to understand what your long-term strategy is going to be for sustaining the project. And that's what funders really want to see. They don't want to invest their money and see the project go away. Any questions on that? Okay, let's go through another foundation grant. I pick Alabama Power Foundation grant because um, I think it's, everybody knows Alabama Power in the state. Um, they do funding. They were on that original list I showed you of um, top 20 funders. Um, so one of the things that you see is what do they fund? So when you look at this list, what is your project and does it fit in any one of these categories? Now, some of you may ask, what is Health and Human Services? You could do, or what is community life and how is it defined? So in order to really answer that question, what I would do would be to reach out to Alabama Power or to read the guidance and see if they define what community life is. If they don't define it for you, then I would reach out to the funder, pick up the phone and call them or send them an email and ask them how they define community life. Because I think those, the reason I picked this is because I think we could all define community life differently. Um, and they may have key words that they use to define community life that we want to use when we write the grant. So you are absolutely can call. They always have a contact that they list for Alabama Power Foundation. And I would encourage you, if you apply and don't understand something, that you do check with the funder. And they like that in most circumstances. Um, so, now, one of the things that Alabama Power is looking at when we talk about sustainability, is this going to be a permanent change? Or is this going to lead to an improvement in the state that will be around? So, if I'm going to do something in a community and I can't write to it where it's going to be something that we can change permanently, or that will lead to some kind of enduring improvement, then would I want to apply to Alabama Power Foundation? Probably not. The other thing that they're looking at, if I am applying to Alabama Power Foundation and applying as public health only, will that rate me high with their foundation? No, because they want to see a diverse group of collaborators written in to the project and they want to see people brought together. So you would have to say, does my project meet that requirement of a group of collaborators? Yes or no? If no, this would not be the grant I would apply for. Um, can the program be duplicated in other communities? Um, that's that evidence-based thing we refer to. So is this something that we can replicate and show impact on. Okay, now, Alabama Power Foundation wants you to address an underserved segment of the population. So if your project does not address an underserved segment of the population, then you don't apply. Um, so we would have to look at demographics, we would have to look at social determinants of health, we would have to talk about health disparities in the needs assessment part of the grant to show that we would address an underserved segment of the population. 
could the organization attract multiple sources of support for the project? What are they saying there? They want to see other funding streams that would be attracted to the project. So that's, once again, in your sustainability plan, you would be looking at if Alabama Power gave you money, right from the start, you're going to be looking at how could you attract other funders to the project or how could you bring them to the table as you're writing this Power Foundation grant. So are there other people in the community, if you applied for $10,000, that would be willing to support you with in-kind donation? Because in-kind does count as support. Um, or were, are there other people in the community that would be willing to put up $500, $600 or make donations of equipment? So that is, uh, those are ways that you could sh show other sources of support. Sometimes we show it where people will allow us to have an office somewhere and pay for the office and the overhead. Sometimes we show it where people allow us to have equipment and utilize equipment. Sometimes we show it from the standpoint of having manpower. I remember when I was um, in charge of the Immunize by Two campaign, I used a Kiwanis club in Montgomery who was extremely generous to deliver flyers to pharmacies to put in children's prescriptions about when children needed to be immunized. Well, I could write that up as an in-kind support because I had boots on the ground support for that project and it was worth a certain amount of time. There is, and I um, did not pull it for this workshop, but I will pull it for a future workshop if you all are interested in future workshops where there's an IRS approved list of how much something is worth. So in the budget, you can show in-kind and you can use the IRS to value that in-kind support and then there's really no questions. If the IRS says it's worth that much, then you don't have to worry about making some figure up um, and it, it supports that figure. So I will pull that. Um, fiscal management and accountability. One time we were doing a project with UAB, public health, and another entity. And the other entity decided they wanted to take the lead on the project. Um, we allowed them to take the lead, but they could not demonstrate sound fiscal management and accountability like UAB could or public health could. And we did not receive the funds because they were the lead agency and they were the ones that were going to have to demonstrate that. So when you're looking at collaborating with other people to apply for funding, make sure whoever that lead organization is, that they have a history of fiscal management and accountability, that they can show they've handled other grants, whether it's federal or foundation grants. Um, because if you don't have that long history, you may not get the project. Okay, so now what I wanted to do, we have about 15 minutes left and I wanted to take maybe the next 10 minutes just to talk about common parts of a grant. If nobody has questions, um, let me just say one more thing about grant sources. There are a lot of grant sources that charge you money to identify grants. I really am not a big fan of spending money to find grants. I think that we have enough resources um, on the internet that we can. Now, if you were a professional grant writer and writing grants every day, you may want to join the foundation.org, I think, where they charge you $19.95 a month to get grant announcements. But for people who are just starting out, I don't think you need to pay anything to identify grants. Um, I think that we have enough information just with the foundation list that I gave you, with the rural information hub that we went through, and then with local communities. So, you know, some of the, you know, in Alabama we have a lot of car manufacturing plants such as Hyundai and Mercedes, and certainly we have gotten funded from Hyundai and Mer Mercedes in the past when I worked with not-for-profits or other um, projects. So, you know, you just really need to look in your community. You need to see where the resources are. And I would not recommend you signing up or paying money unless you're going to be writing grants every single day 
um, and becoming a professional grant writer. All right, so let's go to common parts of a grant. Now this list of common parts of a grant is not exhaustive. Um, you have certain grants that may have some component parts that are not listed here. Um, but I just wanted to sort of focus on really the big parts of a grant. So the need statement is the first thing that a grant, uh, a grantor wants to see. So what is the problem? All right, now in the problem, you really, in this problem statement, you really don't want to really talk about yourself a lot. You want to talk about what your project is going to focus on. You want to paint the picture for the funder. You want to assume they really don't know your community. So they, this is painting a picture. You want to use as much credible data and we will have, there's a tremendous number of data sources that I can share with you in a, a subsequent grant writing class. Um, so you want to make sure you cover data in this. You also want to make sure your need statement aligns with the funder's goals. So if the funder's goal was access to care, you want to talk about access to care and what's going on in that community. So you may use the data um, in the Office of Primary Care and Rural Health. Um, in the past, we used health professional shortage area data. We talked about the lack of providers, and we had numbers affiliated with that. Um, so there's a way to build, you know, what, who are the other providers in the community, um, where are people, where are the gaps in services. Um, so you want to make sure whatever that funder's goal is that you repeat those words and terms in the need statement. Um, at the end of the need statement, and as I said, this, is, this can be a whole hour of discussion in itself. Um, and so we're really doing a high level sort of overview in today's um, one hour intro to grant writing. But in the needs statement at the end is where you would say how your agency will address the problem. So you don't want to start out with how your agency is going to address the problem. You're going to start out with what is the need. You're going to support it with good data. You're going to make sure it reflects the goals of the funder. And then at the end, you're going you're gonna to talk about how your agency is going to address the problem. So remember back in BBVA, I think, and also in Alabama Power Foundation grant, they talked about an underserved population. This is where I would make sure that you, you point out who the underserved population is, what they look like so the funder understands that you're going to honor that goal of the funder. So, and you know, as I said, we would, we would almost be able to do a one hour class on how to write a need statement. So if that is something you all are interested in, please let us know via email or on your evaluation. The next part um, that's very common in grant are goals and objectives. I um, think this is one of the most difficult places in a grant. Um, because I get real confused with goals and objectives. And I don't know if you all get confused on goals and objectives. What is a goal and what is an objective? So the goal is really the overarching goal <laughs> that you have. So it's what are you going to do sort of in the big picture. So if it's decrease um, transportation barriers could be a goal. All right, so I'm going to decrease transportation barriers. My objective is how I'm going to meet that goal. So it's going to be my specific and measurable steps. So it's going to be something I can measure to meet the goal of, of um, reducing transportation barriers. So we could work through, and this would be something that we would do in a um, goals and objective workshop is we would just focus on writing goals and objectives. We want to make sure that anything we do is measurable. So that really is a harder thing to do than people expect. Um, so in the case of reducing transportation barriers as a goal, an objective may be um, 
having a physician's office offer transportation to his office. So picking a specific physician, and we would have to write up something that was specific and measurable to do that. And so this is some area that we would need to practice that in. And I did not bring examples, and I apologize because I thought we were going to be running through this so quickly. Um, the next very important section is work plan and timelines. Personally, what drives me crazy about work plan and timelines is sometimes they have these grids that they give you that you have to complete. And um, it's very difficult to do their charts and grids sometimes. But this is where you show how, here's my work plan for achieving those objectives and goals. And it has to have the timeline specific. Now, when you set up a work plan, the biggest mistake is that you overdo it. So you want to do this like really big work plan and have a whole lot of stuff to achieve and you have these very tight timelines and that is a common initial mistake. I made it where you know I just crammed in a whole lot of stuff and then tried to um, put short timelines on it and then you have to write up why you don't meet your timelines. So in doing a work plan and timelines and in a, if we had a separate um, workshop on this, we would really practice sort of how to set up timelines in a way that's manageable and is realistic. And I think sometimes we're so passionate about the work we do, we do not think about realistic timelines or even realistic goals and objectives. And so that's something we have to keep in mind. Evaluation over the last 15 years has become a much more important part of a project. Sometimes you have outside evaluators that come in and will look at the impact and outcomes of a project. For smaller projects, that would be somebody internally and we would have to set up how you would do the evaluation of the project. Um, and that, you know, evaluate, in an evaluation, you may talk about barriers. You know, we had plans um, where sometimes timelines are out of your control. So, for example, if the general fund budget was cut and you had a program that was addressing something you had written in a grant and that program could no longer be funded, that is a barrier that comes up and you have to report that to the, the grantor. So it's better to be upfront if you don't meet a timeline. It's better to say, here's what obstacles prevented us from our achieving our goals because there are activities um, that sometimes look really good on paper, but you never know what could come up that would cause you not, that would cause a problem in meeting those goals and objectives or the work plan timelines. Um, budget and budget narratives, a very fun section of a grant. Um, and in public health, we do have a lot of people that sort of look at our budgets and make sure they're reasonable and feasible. Um, we also have to be careful in budgets because you have things like indirect cost rate that you have to make sure you figure correctly. You have health insurance costs. And so that all has to be handled um, with our financial um, area. Um, sustainability, we already talked about. This is also a big piece of grants and usually have a lot of points associated with it. And that is what we talked about with long-term vision for your plan, beyond the grant funding, how you're going to diversify your funding sources, and you know what kind of community support and in-kind is available. So those are the sections of a grant. Of course, we could not cover all that in one hour. So I hope that what we did cover was a little bit helpful to you all, that it gave you some um, idea of how to prepare for a grant and it gave you some grant sources that you can look at. And then it also sort of gave you some tips on how to approach a grant. So Renee, if um, people want some future one hour workshops, we're delighted to do that. Just let us know. And I hope that um, you all will go out maybe before our next, you know, if we do another workshop and maybe look at a possible funder um, you are welcome to email me um, with any questions. Um, also, Jamie Durham, as I said, for all ADPH employees, if you are going to apply for a grant, please notify Jamie Durham first before you do that um, so that we have 
you know, we make sure that there are no other issues in registering or tax ID or something else that could come up. Well, we also need to make sure that we don't have counties or areas competing against each, each other, other for the same amount of money when they could probably combine forces. So that's the reason why we really need Jamie to be notified. Um, do we have any questions in the audience? We actually have an email question. Okay. <clears throat> okay, great. Um, going back to your example earlier when you talked about a grant needing 20 pages, mm -hmm. you know, as a, as a maximum, uh, and not going over that, will it count against you if you have under 20 pages? Uh, you know, does that look bad if you only have 10, or, you know, should you try to hit the 20? Well, and I think more the most important, I think that's a really good question, number one. Um, I don't think that they, you get punished if you're under the count for your pages, but I really would encourage the person who asked the question to make sure that you address all component parts of the RFP or the FOA because the grant writers have put a page number there. It probably sort of an average that they took. Um, so all I would make sure of is you may be very succinct and you may get the grant and, you know, it's not really pages as much as content. What I wanted to warn people about, if it says 20 pages and you go over 20 or if it says 80 pages and you go over 80, they won't read it. So you could do a whole lot of work and they put the proposal in the trash can. And I, and I have known of cases where that has happened. Um, under, you know, if you're doing half the pages, I would just make sure you really answer all the questions and meet all the expectations in the guidance. But no, it's not going to count against you. Okay, we also have a phone call from Area 1. So Area okay. 1, go ahead with your question, please. I actually have two questions, Carolyn. Uh, first of all, I wanted to confirm, is ADPH's uh, tax status the 501c3? As a state agency, we're considered um, a not-for-profit, so you can apply, yes, so you, we would meet that criteria. Okay. And also, I had a question, you know, when you look at grants, some of them require matching funds, and I didn't know what ADPH's capability was if you found one that required matching funds. You know, I think that would be a conversation that we would have to have through Jamie. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, depending on what the project is and, you know, maybe, you know, we could, first of all, you cannot match federal funds with federal funds. So if somebody was looking, and this is one of the reasons that we really need to coordinate grant writing. So if you were looking at something that was, you know, a federal program, you could not take something that we're doing, for example, in the central office with federal funds and match that. So there are a lot of requirements we have to be very careful of. The other thing with matching funds, if we're speaking of a foundation, we may be able to find, you know, it depends how it's written, because you could find a collaborator that might want to put up funds with you, which would minimize what we have to do. Also, with matching funds, they do allow you sometimes to do in-kind. So if we were doing some kind of project where we were using our office space, where we were using our people to do it, where we have um, Michael Smith maybe doing training through the satellite linkage, we could all use that as in-kind. So matching funds, I don't want to answer that question as yes or no, definitely. We would really have to dig a little bit deeper and see if in-kind was allowed as a match. Because sometimes that's the way you get away from putting um, direct dollars into it. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Okay. Do we have any other questions? No more emails? Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today for this. It was a very brief overview, but very much what we needed. If you want to go deeper on any of these topics, please include that in your evaluation, and we will try to set that up as soon as we can. But thank you all, and have a great day. Thank you.